Good evening and welcome to the 2017 public lecture series on the Wisconsin idea, past and present. This lecture series is part of a course being taught under the auspices of the Department of Sociology. I, uh, my name is uh, Eric Sandgren. I'm a professor at the School of Veterinary Medicine, and I have the honor to serve as the instructor of the course for this semester. To celebrate the end of the harvest season, I thought I'd dress casually tonight and uh, uh, wear this sweater with my parents on it. <laughs> the Wisconsin idea has always been about more than training students for the work source. It meant, as Adley Stevenson once put it, a faith in the application of intelligence and reason to the problems of society. The aspiration to light the way of Wisconsin's citizens and government with the best torches of knowledge and understanding that their university can provide. Accordingly, this lecture series and the course with which it is associated aim to bring students, staff, and faculty in the UW system into a broad conversation with the citizens of the state about how the knowledge produced at the University of Wisconsin has benefited the public in the past and continues to do so today. I encourage you to participate actively through our course website, www.wiskidea.com. If you would like to contribute to this project, please consider making a contribution to the Wisconsin Idea Course UW Foundation Fund, uh, which you can do through the website. We are fortunate to continue our series tonight with a lecture by Myra Marks Ferry who is the Alice H. Cook Professor of Sociology and Joint Governance Professor of Gender and Women's Studies. She's been at the UW for 17 years and or Director of European Union Center of Excellence and the DAD Center for German and European Studies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ferry. Thank you. Thank you. Is the microphone working properly here? All right. All right. Oh. All right. So what I'm going to try to do tonight is to refocus your attention on the relationship between women and women's struggles to be recognized as citizens of the state and of the country, um, and with the uh, struggles over the knowledge politics of this and other universities. Now, there are moments in this story where UW and the state took a leadership role, and others where UW was at best typical um, and maybe worse. But women in the Wisconsin, uh, I've got to put this somewhere else. This is too large. How about over here? Yeah, all right. Um, but women did play leading roles at several critical junctures and struggled consistently to make both Wisconsin and its university more democratic and less centered on men as actors and beneficiaries of knowledge. So I'm going to start way back in 1848, which is a really crucial year. Um, it's a crucial year for reasons that you're very familiar with, um, namely, that the state of Wisconsin and the University of Wisconsin were established in 1848. Um, but 1848 is also really remarkable as a year for several other reasons. It's also when the Women's Suffrage Convention was held in Seneca Falls, New York, uh, which was the first time that women actually uh, demanded a right to vote. Um, it is also the year that the Communist Manifesto was uh, written um, the first time, therefore, that there was an appeal made to the workers of the world to unite. Um, and it was also the year in which a wave, a famous wave of democratic revolutions swept through France, Germany, Poland, Hungary, Italy, a whole variety of European countries. Um, this particular moment um, was called the springtime of nations. It was 1848. These revolutionaries are actually more connected to our local history than you might think. The springtime of nations was called that because it's really the beginning of modern nationalism, the beginning of thinking of states as the places where 
ethnic nations uh, were represented by the citizens of those nations. Um, it was an aspiration, too, for democratic expression of popular sovereignty. It united both the middle classes and the workers against the aristocracy. Um, it called forth new legislative assemblies um, throughout Europe. And it was met with a reactionary reconsolidation of power by the elites um, that defeated this whole set of revolutions. And many of the revolutionaries picked up their baggage and fled, often to the United States and to England. Among these revolutionaries are some women who are notable often by their, the lack of attention given to them. Um, because 1848 was not just a time of democracy and nationalism, it was also part of a global movement for women's rights, which the suffrage convention in Seneca Falls barely represented. In France, Jean de Rouen was one of the leading revolutionaries, as well as an articulate uh, campaigner for suffrage, if, after all, ordinary people were to get a right to participate, then it should be women as well. Um, she also was the first woman to be seat to run for national office and was seated um, in a supplemental role. They would not recognize her as a real legislator. And she published a um, particular newspaper calling on women to be active participants in democracy, uh, the Voix des Femmes, Women's Voice. In Germany, Louisa Otto Peters had a very similar kind of role. She was a revolutionary. She was a friend of August Babel, whose name you probably are more familiar with than hers. She was also someone who stood up and said, women's suffrage is a critical right. Women are citizens. Um, she founded a women's newspaper, too, the Frauenzeitung. And its uh, motto on the top of the a uh, newspaper was Dem Reich der Freiheit Werbich Bürgerinnen. I am recruiting uh, for women to be citizens in the realm of freedom. Really mobilize women to take part in this movement. Meanwhile, on the other side of the ocean, on the bottom part here, um, we note that Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were part of that Seneca Falls meeting. Um, they're very well known. Um, Susan B. Anthony, by the way, was succeeded by Carrie Chapman Catt as the president of the National Association, National American Women's Suffrage Association. Um, she, Catt was from Ripon, Wisconsin, um, and followed Susan B. Anthony and preceded Alice Paul um, as the leaders of the campaign for women's suffrage in the late part of the 19th century. But it's also interesting to look in Wisconsin at the revolutionaries who came over, the so-called 1848ers, who came over from Germany to participate in what was going on in the United States. Um, there was a good mix of both women and men, but the women who came were right out and out feminists. Uh, Mathilde Annika, 1848er, who went to Milwaukee, and following on Louisa Otto Peters' kind of model, she began to publish the Frauenzeitung, the same, kind, same name for the same kind of newspaper, but in Milwaukee uh, rather than in Leipzig. Um, two other uh, immigrants who I think are worth singling out are Margrethe Meyer Schertz and Karl Schertz. There is, by the way, an endowed professorship at UW named for Karl, uh, nothing for Ma Margarete. Um, Bertha and Johannes Ronge. Bertha and Margaretha were sisters, and all four of them were 1848ers, and all of them had to get the heck out of the German principalities and go find asylum somewhere. Um, Bertha and Johannes um, went to England, um, where Johannes founded the splinter group from Roman Catholicism, which is called German Catholicism. Um, and Bertha founded the first kindergarten in the UK. Uh, Margaretha and Carl came to the US 
Um, and Carl became a general in the Union side of the Civil War, as well as a statesman uh, through the late 19th century. But when they settled in Whitewater, Wisconsin, Margarita said, we need a kindergarten here. And she established the first kindergarten in the United States. Now, I am absolutely convinced you're all saying, what does kindergarten have to do with women's rights? And why is kindergarten something that revolutionaries would set out to do? But kindergarten was, in fact, an idea developed in the German parts, hence the term kindergarten or child's garden, a garden where children could grow, was a new democratic ideal, an, a democratic idea that was led, for the most part, by women and was seen as for women. The, the movement for kindergartens was a challenge to the idea of raising children under the strict discipline of authoritarian fathers, and where fathers were the ones who were seen to have the rights over children, and that the children should start learning to memorize things when they were about three or four years old, and the first thing that you should be teaching children is Latin and Greek. Um, and this whole classical male model of teaching and learning was challenged by the idea of a kindergarten where children could go and discover things, play, learn to cooperate, develop social skills, model what a democratic citizen should be like, um, really use education in order to raise children who would be citizens, who would be curious, who would be innovative, who would be participatory, and who would take charge of their own learning. And this was associated with a new model of both femininity and masculinity. The idea of the kindergarten was one in which both boys and girls would learn to express their emotions, would learn to cooperate. It was not about giving orders and following orders. Uh, and it was also a place where women could um, use their mothering skills um, to help raise a whole new generation um, that would be democratic citizens. Now, of course, the paradox comes in, how are women supposed to be educating children to be citizens and to be free people um, who could control their own destinies when women were not educated and women were not free? Um, so the whole notion of kindergarten and appreciation of women's contributions to raising the next generation also raised the question of what about women's higher education? What were women supposed to be educated to do so that they could make children what they wanted children to be? So one of the first things, again, following out from 1848, the universities established in 1848, but the first actual class at UW was not held until 1850, and of course it was only of men they established what was called a normal department. And normal colleges and normal schools and normal departments was what, at that time, was the term used for teacher training. And most of them changed their names then to teacher training colleges or state teachers colleges. Um, but the normal department was called the normal department because it was the place where you taught how to teach the norms and um, appropriate values and appropriate ways of behaving that would make you into the citizens of the future. And so education was seen as about inculcating citizenship in the form of learning these appropriate norms. And the normal school is where people went to learn how to instill these norms in others. It wasn't until 10 years after the first UW class that the first women were admitted to the normal department. And at that point, it began to face some backlash. The leading backlasher in the first instance was President Chad Bourne, who established a separate female college and expressed how absolutely ridiculous it seemed to him to th even think about giving a bachelor's degree to a woman. Women cannot be bachelors of anything, he said. Um, so women should get educated, but they should have lower level courses, they should have less demanding uh, curricula overall, and they should certainly not graduate with the men. By 1871, the female colleges ended, 
1875, they finally let the women and the men walk up and get their degrees together. And then, of course, no sooner you have a bit of progress, but you have a bit of backlash. Um, you had a number of faculty and about half the Board of Regents saying, no, no, we have to go back to a female college. The other half won. President Bascom, in this case, lined up with the advocates of co-education. And by about 1890, it was pretty clear that the idea of a separate female college was dead and gone. However, by 1908, we also have the idea that President Van Huys and Richard Ely proposed that now that it's important to be teaching things like political economy, maybe we should set up separate classes for women in political economy. Now, I want to emphasize here, they didn't do this with a bad intent. They were not, in fact, part of a backlash to go back to segregation, though they were often treated as if they were. Their argument was that in the Eastern colleges, the elite um, schools in the East, there were women's colleges, and in the women's colleges, women studied things that they didn't study at places like UW, where they would have to study them with men. They studied political economy at Bryn Mawr and at Smith and at Mount Holyoke. They studied science at Bryn Mawr and Smith and Mount Holyoke, but they wouldn't do it in co-educational classes, so maybe we needed to have classes where we could learn the things that were really important. Um, and this whole late 18th century was a period, in fact, that was really um, defined by the explosion of interest in women's education. Um, it wasn't just so that women could be kindergartners, which is what they called kindergarten teachers at that time, um, but it was also to think about the overall notion of spreading literacy and spreading democracy, which were seen as going hand in hand, and affirming the idea that women too were citizens of this country and citizens of this state. Um, the politics of this, which is now often referred to as first wave feminism, running from 1848 to 1920, was very clearly a politics that linked women's right to education and women's right to vote. Um, what was women's education supposed to be for? It was supposed to be uh, for a uh, citizenship that would mean uh, not just an abstract right, but an opportunity for women that we could call cleaning house <coughs> politically. Um, there was a lot of movement um, associated with what was called, at that time, Republican motherhood, which has absolutely nothing to do with the Republican Party of today. Um, but a Republican mother was a mother who raised their children to be active citizens, um, was someone who was engaged in what was often called domestic house, um, civic housekeeping. And civic housekeeping meant things like fighting for uh, public sewage systems and running water uh, being delivered to homes and raising the sanitary level of the cities. It also meant uh, the settlement house movement was also understood to be part of civic housekeeping. It was also cleaning house politically in the sense of getting rid of corruption. Um, the idea that women would come in with brooms and clean up the country um, was tied to this notion of women as full citizens. Um, and this ambition to be full citizens was embedded in the university right from the beginning, even though there was all this struggle about how much women should actually be included. So the initial um, building of, of the university was very explicitly and institutionally segregated. Um, big step forward in 1909 when Lathrop Hall was built, which included for the first time some club rooms and a gym for women because they were excluded from the first student union building on the lakeshore until 1928, which is when the Memorial Union was built. From 1911, women also had their own student self-governance association, 
which was actually a national leader in encouraging women's engagement in governance in the pre-suffrage era. When it was a pretty radical thing to be talking about women holding office in the university as the leader of the Women's Self-Governance Association. So what kinds of radicals are we talking about here? Well, the Women's Self-Governance Association invited Emma Goldman to speak on campus in 1915 um, and had the support of Professor Edward Ross. You may have remembered we talked about him before, um, but Van Hys was very much against it. Still, Wisconsin brought up a suffrage amendment um, in 1912 and lost to a referendum. Uh, the students and faculty turned out pretty much uh, unanimously in support, though of course only the male faculty could vote. Um, as in national politics, World War I brought political advantages to women because they had made some gains while women were off at war. And it's interesting what kinds of gains happened. Um, one interesting thing that was offered is the university, uh, again, with the idea of being at the forefront of uh, including uh, people at the university into training for citizenship, offered a co-educational class in auto mechanics in 1919 so that all the women and men um, could become familiar with this new technology, um, which is what you needed to be a self-governing uh, person. Um, after the war and after suffrage in 1920, the separate institutions for men and women declined and co-education flourished. Not only did the new Memorial Union include both women and men, the Women and Men's Self-Governance Associations merged. And guess what? It's about 40 years before a woman is elected to head the new merged association, the separate one being quite different. And women were now allowed in uh, social clubs as well as in classes. The historian Nancy Cott emphasizes that feminism as an organized movement also declined from 1920 on because the variety of women's interests began to be accommodated in mixed sex organizations um, and in political parties and women's sense of solidarity was no longer sustained by systematic gender segregation in all areas even though sports and housing remained entirely separate and unequal on this campus. The opportunities opening to women students were greater than the opportunities opportunities that they would have after graduation. And we can see this to some degree in the uh, waves of women who were beginning to gain some foothold in men's institutions, including, in this case, um, the first woman professor at UW, Helen C. White. She's not just a building. Uh, <laughs> She was a professor of English from 1919, when she was appointed as an instructor, um, until her retirement in 1965. She is the only woman with a pre-1930 UW PhD to become a full professor at any large state university. She was such a figure that she was awarded 23 honorary doctorates, became a fellow of the American Academy, of sciences. Uh, she would, was the first woman president of the AAUP um, and was a major leader in the AAUP. She was a real presence on campus. Uh, apparently she was known by the nickname of the Purple Goddess um, for, the re for several reasons. Her clothing preferences leaned always towards purple. She was over six foot tall. She had a commanding, booming voice and was a real presence in the lives and actions of her students, both male and female. She writes a very interesting thing about having been intimidated about the first time she was going to teach men, but she found that if she just treated them just like she treated the women students, they fell in line quite readily. Um, so she was a real commanding presence, but she was also rather an anomaly. And I want to take a moment to do a little sociology here and borrow from Claudia Golden's uh, wonderful article, The Long Road to the Fast Track for Women. And what she does in this uh, table, 
and in the article in general, and I'm going to talk you through it a little bit, um, is to show you how typical White was in some ways of her cohort and how the different cohorts that come along afterwards also have people who are uh, exemplars, if you will, of that kind of life course. This first cohort of those who graduated from uh, university graduated before World War I, uh, and they, by and large, as college graduates, did not marry, did not have children. Also, if they married, they did not work, and uh, by and large, were women who graduated from college were confronted with two options. They could get married, in which case their education was over, except for volunteer work, um, which some engaged in, or they could not marry and devote themselves to the common good. And that common good, self-sacrifice notion of uh, don't marry, take care of the community, was very, very present in the first cohort. And H.C. White was a good example of that, um, as were a number of the women who went to Washington it, who were of that first cohort as well. Um, the second cohort, the ones that came in um, with degrees after World War I, were a little bit more likely to marry, a little bit more likely to have children, uh, but by and large still had a large proportion who were very strongly committed to making the country great, to civic housekeeping, not domestic housekeeping. Um, and for them, the, the options were all very, quite, very limited. A teeny tiny number could go into teaching at levels higher than elementary school. Uh, office work was considered a really very exciting top-level job. Now, I want to draw your attention to cohort three, uh, which is the post-World War II generation. Um, these are the women who, for the very first time, graduated from college and got married and then dropped out of the labor force and had kids. Uh, the baby boom comes in part from these women as well as those who did not graduate from college. They had children, they got married, and they began to work also. But they faced incredible obstacles in attempting to do so. The kinds of jobs that were open to them were very limited. Now I just want to name a few of the women who kind of exemplify cohort two or cohort one. The cohort one, besides H.C. White, those of you who might recall Frances Perkins, uh, FDR's Cabinet Secretary for Labor. Um, by Cohort two, Oveta Kulp Hobby, who was the head of the Women's Army Corps during World War II, and was the very first of anybody, not the first woman, but the very first to lead the new department that was created in 1953 in the federal level, Health, Education, and Welfare. This tells you something about how women's idea of uh, civic participation, the idea that women would do civic housekeeping, the, the idea that women were responsible for health, education, and welfare of the country at large, not just of individual children, was very much part of the thinking of cohorts one and two. By the time we get to cohort three, we're looking at a somewhat different story, and we're going to come back to that in a minute, but the person that I'm going to choose to talk about as an exemplar of cohort three is Kay Clarenbeck. Um, what I really want to point out at this point is that college and what happened after college, what faced women of every generation as they graduated, was a system that was of higher education and of occupations that was very strongly segregated by gender. The horizontal segregation suggested that women should stick to women's affairs and not the general liberal arts of full citizenship. As, often the, as was evidenced already in the example I give of women students who are choosing not to take political economy in courses with men. Instead, they were taking home economics and teacher training, which were the places where women were welcome in coeducational schools. 
The dismissal of women as less capable and less interested was also evident in the way who, women who bucked tradition and tried to enter the fields defined as men were, were treated. Overt discrimination blocked women from being hired at all in liberal arts departments. Um, and uh, also um, very much limited the kinds of op opportunities that they had to be promoted if they were hired at all. So vertical segregation by rank, as well as horizontal segregation by fields, majors, and schools, really described the foundation, the university from the beginning, which is why people are often pre prepared to say, oh, the university was a male institution right from the start. Well, it's true. Uh, the University of Wisconsin in the beginning, and here's a really very simple kind of chart. Uh, the first thing that you see on the chart, and I don't have a pointer, I'm afraid. I forgot to, to take up a pointer. But the first thing you see at the, on the chart is that the number of women on the faculty, or the proportion of women on the faculty goes down as the size of the university grows. There are more women there when the university is teeny tiny. Once you start hiring men, boom, it disappears. Uh, the the uh, only groups that increase from about 1906, which is around here, are instructors and assistant professors. This bottom line that stays totally flat are full professors. Forget it, women were not going there. The few, very few full professors there were those tiny numbers, H.C. White, and a few people in home economics. Um, not even in the normal school. Then you have the associate professors rising. And I think it's interesting to see here, because we're going to see this kind of thing later, to think about this. There's kind of a pipeline effect. That is to say, this is when women get the vote. Okay? And you can see, boom, all of a sudden, now we can hire women as assistant professors, not just as instructors, women are legitimate. And then, seven years later, we see a jump up in associate professors. What's the difference? Well, seven years later, those assistant professors can get promoted. So the rise in associate professors comes later. But what you don't see is seven years after that, any jump up in professors. <laughs> and that's important. We'll come back to that. OK, home economics. I said a little disparagingly, that's where the women were, but that's true. Uh, home economics was also, like kindergartening, a more radical field in the 1890s and 1920s than it later became. It involved outreach to women teaching chemistry, biology, agronomy. Even in 1919, pre-suffrage, Extension offered a course on citizenship and government for women. That's a radical idea. Women were not even allowed to vote. One of the leaders of extension and of home economics role in extension um, was Nellie Kedzie Jones. And Jones is really interesting because in 1912, she started out as a columnist outside of Wisconsin. UW recruited her um, to lead the Outreach to Women program. Um, in extension, to teach home economics plus citizenship skills. Um, the two things were seen as very much hand in hand. She became very famous across the state for write a, a book, uh, a, a series of advice columns that came out as in, in newspapers and then was put together in a book, where she pretended to write letters to an imaginary niece named Janet from Aunt Nellie. Um, and Janet had, and her husband had supposedly just moved from the city and desperately needed all the basic housekeeping advice, like how to keep chickens and uh, how to bake a pie and a wood stove and all of those uh, skills that I'm sure you all have um, and therefore you wouldn't worry about. Um, she traveled all over Wisconsin. She, she held the position as the Home Economics Extension Leader from 1918 to 1933 went all over Wisconsin speaking to women's clubs, organizing homemaker clubs, not only writing her Aunt Nellie's pamphlets, she gave radio talks. She was one of the first to use WHA to do outreach to women. 
After her retirement in 1933, she was made an emeritus professor, the very first woman to be given the honor of uh, the emeritus rank at the University of Wisconsin. And she continued to give talks on WHA until 1956, uh, when she died at the age of 97. Uh, home economics was also the home for the University of Wisconsin School for Women Workers, which was established in 1925 as a summer program that brought 40 girls from nine Midwestern states to Madison to study economics, English, and physical education which was a selection of courses tailored to meet the needs of working women. They got a three-month release from their employers. Their expenses were paid by a scholarship fund raised from organized labor, women's clubs, university alumni, and the YWCA. And the women were housed on the Madison campus. The women, most of whom had not completed high school, came from garment and shoe factories, knitting mills, packing houses, and other industries for six weeks of education and social activities. They met with the noteworthies of the university. They met with labor leaders, like Elizabeth Christman of the Women's Trade Union League. The idea here was to enlighten young women to make them better citizens, better mothers, and maybe also better labor leaders. The purpose was not to educate them so they would not have to work in menial jobs, but rather to provide them a fuller and freer life through understanding current events, workers' issues, and themselves. Lectures were taboo. Classes were run in discussion format, often held out of doors. Remember, this is a summer school. Uh, the idea was, like the kindergarten, like home ec, provide the skills in which women could think for themselves, translate that independence back to their communities, be leaders and democratic participants um, in the roles um, in which they are situated. So let me, just moving along here, um, point you to some of the more modern developments. We're now at the third cohort of women coming through. Um, and, Clay, and as I've said, Kate Clarenbach is a great example of this, um, a beneficiary of the doors that were opened by the pioneers, but also reacting to the demand that marriage and children come first and that you can't hold the higher ranks or appointments in the core disciplines or be paid equally to men if you manage to cross the threshold into the university. So she's such a great example. Her 1946 degree puts her right on the front edge of that third cohort um, that Claudia Golden describes. Typically, she married and had her children first, then began to pursue her career ambitions. Um, she got her PhD in 1946, um, but then um, it was 1962 before she held a first paying job. She had been a volunteer in the Henry Wallace campaign before that. Um, and she was recruited into extension partly because the political science department said they were not interested in hiring a woman professor. They had no need for that. Um, but that in extension, she would be able to do what she really wanted to do, which was called continuing education for women. And we could also call that modernizing Nellie Jones's role of reaching women where they were with the tools that they needed wherever in the state they were located. Continuing the connection between educating women and mobilizing women for civic improvement, uh, Clarenbach was appointed to the 1963 State Commission on the Status of Women. And Kennedy had, in 1963, established a National Commission on the Status of Women uh, at the urging of people who were pushing for reconsideration of the Equal Rights Amendment. And the Equal Rights Amendment is a very simple provision to the Constitution that says equality of rights shall not be abridged on the basis of sex. Uh, however, uh, it had been uh, resisted, not by Republicans, but by Democrats, who saw that if you pass the Equal Rights Amendment, then the special labor legislations that protected women in factories and women from working night work or long hours uh, would be done away with because it demanded equal treatment and so it was a bad thing from labor's point of view. So Kennedy put together a state commission on the status of women to reconsider this. Isn't it possible that we could extend protections to workers, to men, 
and not take them away from women and still achieve equality. And so Clarenbach was appointed to the Wisconsin State Commission. There were 50 state commissions. Um, she was particularly notable for how she worked with the labor unions and brought labor unions to the table with the state commissions. Um, she also, um, along with other members of the state commission, sat down with Betty Friedan, who was a guest speaker at one of the commission's meetings, and said, you know, in 1964, the Civil Rights Act says there shouldn't be discrimination against women. Here we are in 1966, and the uh, HEW is not trying to enforce this for women. It says that got in there by mistake, it's not serious, we do not have to worry about discrimination against women. And Friedan said, uh, or is reputed to have said to this, these heads of the state commissions on the status of women, what we need is an NAACP for women. We need an organization to hold the state feet to the fire and make them take discrimination against women seriously. And Kay Clarenbach was in the small group that came together not only to support that, but to realize that and founded the National Organization for Women. She was the first chair of the National Organization for Women. By 1977, um, she was then also the conference coordinator for the International Women's Year uh, Conference in Houston, which was called when uh, the United Nations had a year for women um, in 1976 that all states came and participated in, and one of the things states agreed to when they met in Mexico City in 1976 was to go home and uh, have a national conversation about what it was that women needed in these separate countries. And so the Houston Conference was the US version of that conference. It also was the first time that Phyllis Schlafly burst onto the national stage uh, organizing an anti-ERA, anti-equal rights, anti-women's commission, uh, so-called pro-family movement. Um, okay, so Kay Clarenbach basically takes us not just to the third cohort, but to the second wave of the women's movement. Um, as I say, 1964 brought in the Civil Rights Act and brought in the National Organization of Women, or for women, National Organization for Women to try to get the federal government to enforce that. Um, the struggle over women's rights and inclusion in education was particularly waged in Wisconsin because um, Ber Bunny, Bernice Sandler of the Women's Equity Action League uh, began the first sex discrimination lawsuit against academic institutions. She filed complaints with HEW against 20 major research universities, both public and private, and UW is on that honorable list. Um, so a representative for HEW was sent to investigate. The HEW Chicago Civil Rights Office came out. Um, the university said it didn't know it had a problem. The representative of HEW didn't meet with any women. Uh, the HEW representative went home, the women in Madison began to organize. Um, the very first thing that they did is they get together uh, a meeting in Madison by the so-called Women's Research Group in the spring of 1970. Why didn't they talk to us? We could tell them a lot about discrimination. And by the way, uh, you might recognize a few familiar names in that uh, about 10-person women's research group, uh, Elaine Rubin, uh, who was then an assistant professor of English, an English department graduate student named Susan Stanford Friedman, who's now the director of the Institute for Research in the Humanities, and an extension staff member, Rena Gelman. Uh, I think it's important to note that this meeting, which then led to the Association of Faculty Women, um, that it included not only all ranks of faculty, all the traditional departments, but also extension. It was not, oh, this is a Madison elite thing. Um, and they started gathering data and they started making a case. So what did they do? Um, they appointed the first person in the administration who would even take a look at discrimination. Um, and it's interesting to note that she was appointed in 1971, which is the very same time that the UW system is created. And the very first activities taken on behalf of faculty in the system 
organizing something at the system level happens from women. Uh, the Wisconsin Coordinating Council for Women in Higher Education was essentially a group founded by Joan Roberts and Ruth Blyer, who literally drove all over the state, meeting with all of the faculty women in all of the different campuses to get people involved in speaking out and making them members of the Association of Faculty Women. Um, by 1972, this is beginning to be seen not because Madison somehow leads the way on gender and women's studies, but the <coughs> earliest courses start emerging at Madison, Milwaukee, Whitewater, Oshkosh, and Green Bay. Why? Because they were all part of the organizing effort. Milwaukee actually had the very first course uh, in 1973 that was a, a program of courses. In Madison, for several years, what was taught was a course called Alice in Academia, which was an overload course for which nobody was paid. Uh, 1972, the first full credit departmentally rec recognized courses for which somebody actually got paid were offered. Um, at, the at about the same time, the System Office for Women's Studies is set up. The System Office for Women's Studies this year is having its 41st annual statewide conference in which participants from all of the system campuses take place and it rotates around among the different campuses. Um, and by the way, so here's the most recent call for papers. Uh, and another thing that is established at the same time, um, 1976, um, is Feminist Collections, which is a quarterly put out on women's studies resources. Uh, circulated by the librarian. Now, of course, this is a time when everything is in paper. And I remember being at the University of Connecticut and subscribing to women's collections, which came in a brown paper envelope, which was a mimeographed set of table of contents of feminist periodicals so that you could actually see what was going on and lobby your library to start getting some of these things too. So it was not just that the women's studies librarian was a unique thing in Wisconsin, which it was, but that the women's studies librarian was in fact a leader nationally in getting women's studies and uh, knowledge about women in the hands of women nationwide. It really led to women's studies as a field. Um, so the women's faculty group did some research at the time, and so we actually have a little bit of data about where the women were in 1970. The university itself claimed it had no idea uh, but the leaders of the Association of Faculty Women called every department and found out by asking the staff in every department, who are the faculty there? They got the very first count of how many men and how many women there were on the faculty. Um, and they found that women were less than 8% of all the full professors still in 1970, um, which was up, of course, from where they were in 1930, but not exactly impressive. And if you only counted those outside of nursing, home economics, and extension, they were only 2.5% of the full professors. The liberal arts remained the area that was seen as the appropriate place for men. Only 157 women held any kind of tenure track appointment out of a faculty of over 2,000. And the differences in salaries was almost a third of what the salary was, about $10,000 when the median was about 30. Um, there were tenure denials that were hotly contested in court cases, which made the university nervous. As a consequence, they also started putting in affirmative action reforms. Affirmative action led to such things that we take for granted now as open searches that are publicly advertised as opposed to you call your buddy and have him him recommend his favorite student. It is when collecting figures on PhD women by field and undergraduate women by field um, actually start to be collected. It's the very beginning of counting and reporting on women's representation in the university. That is now institutionalized as part of what the university does. Um, and we can see in this little chart that even as late as 1987, fewer than 10% of all full professors were women. And notice they're not segregating out nursing and home economics, which I'm sure are helping to make that number 10%. Uh, 
Okay, 30 years later, in 2017, women are 28% of all full professors. Still not exactly breathtaking. As you can see, the, the blue line there shows you how slowly uh, the proportion of uh, full professors has gone up, uh, particularly since, 19, uh, since 2007. It's gone up, but it's gone up at a much, much slower rate than, say, between 1987 um, and 2007. Uh, assistant professors and associate professors, uh, obviously we have a higher proportion of those than of full professors, but notice that you are not seeing the kind of thing we saw in that first graph where, oh, now you have assistant professors, and boom, now you, seven years later you have associate professors. We don't see that same kind of thing here. And the question is why? Well, if we look at new hires by tenure in the tenure track, we see that in all of the past 10 years, um, we've never done better than 50-50 women and men. Most years, eight out of 10, uh, men have outnumbered women among the new hires. And then we look at the next chart, which is tenured by six or nine years later. And the interesting thing there is, why do we say six or nine years? Six is the usual amount of time to get tenure, um, but you now have the opportunity to stop a tenure clock. If you have a baby, if you have an illness, if your spouse is ill, and we have what are called vilest life cycle professorships that will also help to support you and support your research if you stop your tenure clock for some reason um, of emergency. And what you can see there, the purple lines are the women. Um, the lower two lines are after six years and then after nine years. If we did not have a stop tenure clock, the gap between women and men, that is to say at the six year rate, would be pretty substantial. Uh, women still have families and children, or rather women now have families and children that cohort four and cohort five that we didn't talk about before, these are the women who are actually trying to have families and children as well as a career something that was not conceivable for cohorts one through three. Uh, but it's really hard to do. By stopping the tenure clock, women's rate comes up pretty close to men's. And by the way, notice too that it's men's as well as women's tenure clocks that are getting stopped. There are men who are benefiting from being able to stop the tenure clock and being able to get life cycle professorships. The, the gap is just not as great for men as it is for women. We've also done the unimaginable thing and put more women into university leadership, but they're very different kinds of women. Uh, Donna Shalala, who was the first woman chancellor, uh, had been in higher education, and only after she left as chancellor went into government, and notice what she goes into is Secretary of Health and Human Services. Again, remember uh, the establishment of HEW with Olveta Kulp-Hobby as the first head, in 1953, there's a tradition here of associating women with health education and welfare. And I don't think that that's a bad thing, that domestic uh, and civic uh, confounding. The chancellor now, Rebecca Blank, was in government first and then came to the economy. She's a professor of economics and a former secretary of commerce. And that's a very different notion of what the university is for when you think about it in terms of competition, economics, and achievement, um, rather than developing citizens who will help make a better state. Remember what I said about horizontal and vertical segregation? Horizontal segregation is still a big deal in the 21st century. Um, and I just want to draw your attention to a few things. The obvious kinds of things um, are that when you look at engineering, the proportion of uh, undergraduates graduating with a degree in engineering who are women is still pretty low. It has gone up from virtually nobody in 1970 to less than 20% now, but it's still really, really low. But what I really want to draw your attention to is the next line, which is computer sciences which peaks in 1982 and then goes boom, right down to engineering. Um, all of the discussion about women in tech and women in engineering that sort of said, well, are women really good at this? Are women really whatever? They were there. They were driven out. 
uh, as computer science uh, became more the thing. The other thing that I want to draw your attention to is how fast the lines go up between 1970 and 1980. Women move into a whole lot of fields, including fields that we now think of as being very much women's fields. So psychology, um, which is the, which line, the light line starts at about 60% goes up, or, sorry, starts about 45% goes up. Starts here at about 45%, goes up to about 80%. Becomes a female dominated field um, between 1970 and 2010. Um, other fields also go up really dramatically, social science and history, for example. But notice also that since 2000, basically we don't see any increases anymore. The fields have resegregated into their new positions, and nothing much is changing now. Look at the 10 years between 1970 and 1980, and look at the 10 years between 2000 and 2010. There's plenty of room for improvement, but we just don't see very much improvement. <coughs> Um, I took a quick look at the economics department because social sciences comes out at about a 50% uh, ratio in most of the social sciences. Economics is an outlier. Uh, we still are dealing with around that magic 10% of women uh, as full professors in economics. Uh, it hasn't moved. Now, I didn't count the two administrators in that count, um, but the visibility of Rebecca Blank as chancellor and economist is not really changing the way in which economics as a whole is thinking about it, but economics is changing the way we think about universities. One more quick thought about what's happening. Um, recent article um, about women and men and the desegregation of fields, occupations or majors, um, has I think the nicely provocative title, we don't leave, they kick us out. Um, what it basically shows is that for every 100 uh, women that leave a neutral or female dominated occupation to go into a male dominated occupation, 95 leave a male dominated occupation. So the, the five that are left are the survivors that can begin to change the composition of the field. But we get a lot more people going over the barrier, getting into the field, and then leaving. And who leaves? By and large, if you are coming in um, from another male-defined job or undergraduate major, you're more likely to stay. If you try to come in from a female-dominated occupation into a male-dominated occupation, you're out. And that didn't used to be the case. When medical schools first opened their doors to women, the vast number of medical students were former nurses. Okay, I'm gonna, I know I'm going too long here and I just wanna try to wrap it up. So why and how do they kick us out? Um, sexual harassment. We've been talking about that in media a lot these days. Um, and Dean Schultz um, just sent a letter out um, that combined an apology for sexual assault um, in one of the departments here that had made it into the media, but also a long list of all the reporting systems that have been added now to UW-Madison. If we have a reporting system, we don't have a problem anymore, right? Um, well, I draw your attention to a recent article in the Harvard Business Review by Frank Dobbin and Alex Kalev who say, you know, reporting systems don't work. What does end sexual harassment is promoting more women into leadership roles. And we don't necessarily mean they're just a chancellor. Um, differential value of things associated with women, whether it's kindergarten, home economics, uh, nursing, civic virtue, uh, civic housekeeping, uh, all the kinds of things that you associate with women and the automatic response is to say, well, that's trivial. Who cares about kindergarten? Who cares about home ec? Who cares about the stuff that women do? If women are in it, it's not really interesting. Well, 
One of the interesting studies on this, devaluation of all things associated with women, is a, a researcher who went and looked at um, Google searches where parents put in, you know, is my son a genius? Is my daughter attractive? About tw two and a half times as many parents ask about, is, is my son a genius than is my daughter a genius? Or any synonym for genius. And the department that most prides itself on the idea of it stands for genius, this is just pure thought, the Department of Philosophy still is pathetically behind. So the idea that somehow or another the only problems we have about representing women at the upper ranks or representing women in departments at all have to do with engineering and STEM fields, no, philosophy is a humanities and, in, and economics is a social science, but it's a problem. So the last thought here, um, the, the vision for the future, which we could also equally well illustrate with Donna Shalala um, and to some extent, or to some extent with Donna Shalala and Rebecca Blank, the idea of what is it that the university is gonna be. Cassandra, the voice of doom from uh, Greek mythology, warns feminists away from getting involved in governance projects at the university because we are now in a neoliberal discourse of markets. We're looking at capitalist audits of productivity. We're favoring entrepreneurialism. We're accelerating competitiveness. We're doing the business case. And if we get involved in governance and if we try to uh, change the university, they will be using our legitimacy as feminists to gain consent to a market-centered agenda. Possible. Pollyanna, on the other hand, says, terrific, let's have some influence on the universities. Let's institutionalize Title IX. Let's institutionalize the counts of women. Let's institutionalize uh, a lot of pro-feminist policy in the university. Um, on the but Pollyanna, well, although seeing a window of opportunity in these bureaucratic politics of reform, seems to, to argue that we are using this moment of restructuring that's happening in the universities to get some space for diversity. But whether we should really be Pollyanna's or Cassandra's is kind of unclear to me. I do think we ought to share those views with each other. I think we want to be very sure that we are not trying in our concerns with the neoliberal university to say we should go back to the university the way it was 50 years ago. I hope I've convinced you the university of 50 years ago is somewhere where you didn't want to be. Um, but that the university 50 years from now, I will continue to hope is not what we are seeing around us at the moment. Thank you. And I'd like to open uh, the session up to questions. Yes. Uh, and please use the microphone uh, so that the people watching can hear. Oh, I, I, I thought you waved and asked I a question. Yes. Oh, well, that's nice to wave. Uh, <laughs> is there a question? Uh, I will have some, yeah. Okay. Not right yet. I'd like to start out by asking something. Um, one of the things that I've learned over the course of <clears throat> Uh, last year's and this year's Wisconsin Idea uh, uh, course lectures is how many things I wasn't taught as I was growing up. Um, and this just reminded me of one. I would expect that when uh, there was a call for women's vote, there was quite a lot of suggestion that the world would end um, after uh, women were granted votes. That's a, a major change. Um, uh, it, it did the world end? Well, there weren't actually that many people saying that the world would end. What they said was families would, be en would end. It was that the family would be destroyed. Then as now, the politics said feminists on the one side, family values on the other. And families and family values were going to fall apart. Because look at it, women and men in the household, husbands and wives could vote for different people. The father and husband, the patriarch, 
would no longer represent the interests of the entire family. They could actually have a debate over the dinner table and she would not have to listen to him. She could go out and cast her own vote. The family was done for, really. I mean, that was the concern. It was all articulated in terms of family values. And if you want to maintain the family, then you have to maintain the father's authority to make decisions on behalf of the whole family. And husbands should have that right. But it's also that suffrage didn't come out of nowhere. There had been a struggle already for the right, for example, for women to get an education. As I hope I was clearer in saying, much of that struggle was happening already from 1848 to 1920. And getting women into the university, getting women educated, doing the kinds of things that were really radical at that time, including setting up kindergartens, teaching home economics, getting out there and doing this kind of stuff was happening before women had the right to vote. So you had uh, talked about how um, before women had the right to vote, they did have the role of being, I, I don't remember the phrase you gave it, they were political housekeepers. Mm -hmm. what, what was the phrase you used? Civic housekeeping. Civic housekeepers. So um, they had gone through this very lengthy period of, of being considered in that role, and yet when, it, when push came to shove and it was time to grant them the right to vote, um, they were not given credit as their role of civic Well, they had struggled for that role. I mean, it was not the case that people said, oh yeah, kindergarten sounds like a great idea. They had to fight to establish kindergartens. They had to fight to get into the university. They had to fight and demand the right to have women's clubs and associations. The idea that women could just sort of step up to the plate and be civic housekeepers and everybody would say, well, that's fantastic, we love you, do it, clean up the mess, we think that's great. That's, that's reading our thinking about it back on them. Um, they were seen as very much radical women um, who were doing things that they shouldn't have been doing, like going off into the slums unescorted by themselves and taking counts. Women who were doing civic housekeeping, for example, were in many ways the first sociologists. They went and collected data that allowed them to figure out how much money did it actually take to put food on the table for a family in a certain city, in a certain place. They came up with the first family budgets. They came up with the first uh, accounts for what it took to live, what would be a living wage. They lobbied then that there should be a living wage. But first they had to go and collect the data, just as the faculty women had to go and call up every department secretary and figure out how many women are there. How much are people actually spending to eat? What is the rent in such and such a place? Women led those data collection efforts. Because of course at that time we didn't have computers. And they were seen as appropriate for doing housework. And they were seen as appropriate for doing office work. Women could sit there and they could tally on pieces of paper all these little bits and pieces of numbers and come up with some figures. It's not like people said, oh, that's wonderful. Go ahead and do it. They said, what are these busybody women doing going off in the slums and bringing all this embarrassing information? They want us to do something about that. So they, they did. They did not just establish kindergartens. They established public libraries. Again, democracy, literacy, and women's rights. Uh, they established playgrounds. Went along with establishing kindergartens. The idea that children should have safe places to play. Women's clubs did that kind of work. They, uh, UW was not the only one, but it was one of the leaders in having summer schools for women workers. Train women to lead women activities in labor, get decent wages for women. Again, not something everybody approved of. Another question. You've done a beautiful job of outlining the history and historical trends. Um, and of course, one function that that can have is to, to help us imagine uh, where we're going now. 
Uh, it certainly doesn't answer that question. And I'd, I'd like to hear you comment on what you see as any interesting trends in this area. Um, uh, and then also comment on what seems in some ways to, to be a pr pretty dramatic break with where things were in the past, or at least a break in how visible certain attitudes are, um, and, and how you incorporate that into a, a view of what might happen uh, over the next 10 years. I guess I'm not sure what is so much more visible now that wasn't visible then, but I do think that one of the things that is um, very much on people's minds at the moment is the devaluation of everything that has to do with women and the sexual harassment of women as intruders into men's spaces. And that's why I put that as like where we are at present. Because I think we all have mislearned in school to disregard women, to, to tell a story of the 1848 revolutions in which women were not actors, to tell a story of kindergarten, if we notice it at all, as one that had nothing to do with women, to tell a story of the Wisconsin idea and progressive reform as if it had nothing to do with women, to tell a story of the university as if it was developed without women uh, there and making it happen. And so the invisibility and the devaluation of women is something that I think was true then and is true now. And when you think about that distribution that I had of where are the fields, you know which are the fields that count. You know that the fields that are seen as revenue producing, be it football or uh, academic fields that are bringing in grants, revenue producing is valued, uh, civic culture is not. Um, and in the big change that I see is that universities used to be seen as places where civic culture was to be inculcated. Um, liberal arts has nothing to do with liberalism as a political doctrine, which you know someone should tell Scott Walker about. <laughs> uh, but liberal arts, liberal there means uh, having to do with a free person and arts as the practice of something. So the practices of a free person are what liberal arts advances. And so the idea that women did not belong in the liberal arts, because they were not really free people, they were not really citizens. They were special people, women who could do something else. So men could do science, but women could do domestic science in home economics. So you could do chemistry, and some of the leading uh, exponents of uh, home economics in the 1890s to 1910 period were themselves really innovative chemists and biologists, but who applied their skills to doing the kind of chemistry that turned into figuring out how bread rose and how, how beer was made and a lot of the kind of applied work um, in domestic economy was done by women who were trained as chemists or biologists or agronomists, but who could not be hired in the university in those departments, had to do it in the applied arts, because the liberal arts were for men who were free citizens, and women were not free citizens. Time for one more question. I'll steal the last question. Um, thank you. It was really uh, fascinating to um, hear this gendered story of the university. But um, my question was more about, so you really show how the devaluation of, of women and femininity or things that have to do or become associated with women um, kind of obscure the radical move that um, came through the establishment of kindergartens, home economics, etc., and that this an extension. Yeah, and that became um, institutionalized that disregard. And so, in in the face of that, what do you see as um, like do women now, or perhaps in the later parts of the twentieth uh, century, express that civic? Um, commitment in different ways, or what, what were different um, expressions of that in, in the institution or nationally? Well, 
I mean, I think one of the things that we see is women are outraged more when they are not acknowledged as free and equal citizens. And where it was once taken for granted that women are, of course, not free and equal citizens. Um, and where women were really pushing for that. Now, the idea that women are free and equal citizens makes it outrageous, for example, uh, when uh, Hillary Clinton is treated as an anomaly and on the world stage and somehow, you know, what is she doing? You know, why would we have a woman president? You could only vote for her because she's a woman, not because she's capable or this or that or the other thing, right? But, you know, what, what could she be besides a token for women? Women really don't have any right to equal participation governing the country, or women don't really have any uh, right to determine what kinds of values we should be giving to different disciplines. Um, that really thinking in feminist terms about the value of knowledge and what do we really want knowledge for? How are the liberal arts really rethought through the lens of women's studies? And say, really, women's studies is where the liberal arts are now being practiced. <coughs> where you do have a connection between what you learn and what you do, <coughs> between the idea that you are being trained as a citizen to take part in the politics of the moment. Um, that was taken for granted. That uh, That's what, of course, men were supposed to be able to do. And women had to fight for that right to be included as people whose education was of some use, worth investing in. Please join me again in thanking Professor Fairman.